What to do with the Nazi criminals? Was the question on the minds of the Allied leaders as World War II was heading towards victory for their side. Interestingly, the answer was found in the German city of Nuremberg. There, one of the most significant legal proceedings in history took place when 24 of the most powerful Nazi leaders were tried for the crimes committed by the Third Reich. The end of the conflict did not mean the end of the deaths, as 12 of these German leaders were sentenced to die by hanging. In this video, we will tell you what happened to the dozen condemned by the Nuremberg Tribunal and the incredible and macabre fate of their corpses. Welcome to another installment of History Cases. With the surrender of Germany in early May 1945, there was joy around the world, but also a tremendous responsibility. What would happen to the most important war criminals of the Third Reich? Winston Churchill and his foreign secretary, Anthony Eden, had a carefully planned strategy. They believed that as many leaders as possible should be detained and then subjected to a severe trial wherever they were found. The process had to be led by the highest military authority present, and the execution had to take place within six hours. For the British leader, the only way to move forward and deter future Nazi uprisings was the elimination of the remaining leaders including collaborators who had held power. However, there was a surprising twist in the resolution, as Stalin and the Soviets strongly opposed this approach. They demanded trials be conducted where the crimes had been committed. This surprised everyone, but they eventually reached an agreement with the United States and the United Kingdom, organizing one of the most famous legal and political events in history, the Nuremberg Trials of 1945. The tribunal, established in October of that year by representatives of the Allied powers, aimed to judge the involvement of a long list of Third Reich personalities in the crimes committed during the war. For a year, dozens of accused and witnesses passed through the Nuremberg courtroom, including 24 senior Nazi officers who were charged with four counts, conspiracy to commit crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. On the count of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Contrary to what one might imagine, the Nazi leaders preferred to be executed immediately, as they did not want to go down in history in a shameful manner. The alias did not grant their request for immediate execution, but instead opted for a trial through the Nuremberg trials, which formally began on November 20th, 1945. They wanted the world to understand that the response to barbarism and dehumanization was a fair legal process, not revenge. The convicted Nazis received different sentences, but 12 of them, the highest ranking officials, were sentenced to death by hanging. They were Hermann Göring, commander in chief of the Luftwaffe and deputy chancellor of the Fuhrer, Hans Frank, former governor general of Poland, Wilhelm Frick, former interior minister, Walter von Ribbentrop, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Alfred Jodl, former commander of the Eastern Army, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, former commander of extermination camps, Alfred Rosenberg, philosopher and Nazi ideologue, Fritz Saukel, former director of the Slave Labor Program, Arthur Seyss Inquart, former director of the Reichsbank, Wilhelm Keitel, former commander of the German Army, and Julius Streicher, former editor of the fanatical anti-Semitic newspaper Der Stürmer. Two of the condemned did not die by hanging. The first was Martin Bormann, head of the Nazi party chancellery, Hitler's secretary and party leader, who was tried in absentia. For decades, it was believed that he had managed to escape, with some even claiming to have seen him in South America, or that he was thought to be running a secret network. There were those who believed he had died in the fall of Berlin in those final days of the regime. After the sentences were announced, the condemned Nazi leaders awaited their fate. Two of the prominent figures, Martin Bormann and Hermann Göring, met different outcomes. Bormann had died in Berlin in 1945, as determined by forensic studies conducted by Soviet soldiers. Göring, Hitler's designated successor, managed to evade his execution by taking his own life with a cyanide pill. The details of how he obtained the pill 
remained a mystery until an American soldier confessed years later, revealing that he had unknowingly provided it to Goering. The appeals made by the convicted leaders were unsuccessful and their death sentences were upheld. In the days leading up to the executions, the condemned were allowed to see their families for the last time. On October 16, 1946, the sentences were carried out. Ten of the Nazi leaders were hanged in succession, while Goering's lifeless body remained in the prison morgue. The execution took place in the prison gymnasium, with the first hanging occurring at 1.11 in the morning. Each of the condemned was given the opportunity to speak their last words, with many expressing patriotic sentiments. For example, the foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop, stated, God protect Germany, and expressed a desire for German unity and international peace. Some of the Nazi leaders continued to espouse their hatred even in their final moments. Julius Streicher, an anti-Semitic propagandist, shouted, Heil Hitler, as he was led to the gallows. He mockingly declared, The Bolsheviks will hang all of you someday. Purim Fest, 1946, referencing a Jewish holiday. The executioners responsible for hanging the Nazi leaders were Sergeant Major John C. Woods and military police officer Joseph Malta. Rumors circulated that Woods deliberately miscalculated the rope lengths, resulting in some of the condemned being strangled rather than experiencing a swift neck fracture. Reports suggested that certain executions took as long as 14 to 28 minutes. However, the army denied these claims, stating that the drop length was appropriate and that the deaths were due to neck fractures. It is worth noting that the small trapdoor caused some of the condemned to suffer head injuries upon impact. According to German law, the bodies were supposed to be returned to their families within 24 hours of the executions. However, the Allied authorities had concerns about the potential creation of Nazi cult sites if the remains or burial sites were accessible. As a result, they opted for a different approach, which some deemed indecorous. The bodies of the executed Nazi leaders were photographed and then placed in simple wooden coffins after being stripped. False identities were assigned to the bodies, using the names of fictitious American soldiers in order to conceal their true identities. They were transported to the Ostre Friedhof Crematorium in Munich, taking great care to avoid interference with other funerals. There, the bodies were individually cremated, and the ashes were placed in urns labeled with the false names. Following the cremation, the urns were transferred to an American mortuary unit located approximately 20 kilometers away. At the mortuary, the urns were destroyed and the ashes were scattered at an undisclosed location in the Izar River. The clothing and uniforms of the condemned were incinerated, while any valuable badges or decorations were preserved for recycling. Symbolic Nazi decorations, such as the iron crosses, many of which were acquired through criminal means, were effectively eradicated. As we conclude, we would like to ask for your opinion on whether you believe the actions taken by the Allied authorities regarding the bodies of the condemned Nazi leaders were justified.